I was a bit of a rambunctious teenager. Um, I use the word rambunctious because uh, that was probably the kindest way I can describe it. Uh, I've never really ever used that word other than in this moment. Um, uh, others in, in that time of my life would probably have described me as uh, loud, obnoxious, annoying. Um, some of you may describe me as that now. Um, rambunctious sounds way better, doesn't it? Well, to give you an idea of, of who I was as a teenager, um, I was that kid. There's always a that kid. That was me. Uh, we, uh, as a youth group, instead of doing mission trips like we do here at Hope, uh, in, in youth group, in, in my church growing up, we went to camp. And uh, I had the privilege of going to camp for a number of years. And one year, as, as a high school student, I, uh, I was at camp. And it was the first night of camp, uh, which, like any time you're a teenager and you go away from your parents for a set period of time, that first night is when all of the sugar you have consumed kicked in. And you're just excited about not being at home, right? And so you can do anything but sleep. So here I am laying in my uh, bunk bed like every other guy in the dormitory, wired. And we were loud, and we were obnoxious, and we were loud, and we were obnoxious. And, and it got to the point after a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, that our counselor in our dorm was like, all right, guys, time to settle down. It's like 1 a.m., let's go to bed. That worked for a few minutes, and then we, you know, started snickering and laughing and getting louder and louder. And, and then so finally our counselor, after another 10 minutes of this, spoke up and said, guys, that's enough. I don't want to hear another peep. So I responded... Dave, outside. I was that kid, right? I, somebody had to do it. It was me. I hate me for it. Now you know why I am the way I am today. But I like to think, I like to think that I've matured a lot. I hope that you, um, you have seen... Uh, that I've come a long way in, in however many decades it's been since then. Um, I, have, I have grown in many ways this way and this way. Um, I have grown uh, relationally. Uh, I, you know, I still can be a little impulsive and obnoxious at times. You know, it's ingrained in my DNA. Um, but I, I've also grown spiritually a lot in, in the past 25 years. It just you know, it, it, it was bound to happen. And in that growth, I am who I am today. And in that growth, I make uh, pursuits in my daily life. I, I, I continue to grow. And we're going to talk about faith this morning. I hope that's okay. It's a church, you know. So, so I want to talk about the faith side of, of our journey in life. And in my faith journey, I have grown a lot over the past 25 years. And, and I still grow every year. Like, it, it's this whole process thing. It never ends. And some of you have been walking with Jesus for, like, you know, half a century at this point. And you get it, like, because you're, you're still growing. And some of you are, are at a phase where you're like, hey, who's Jesus, right? You know, we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, so it's a process. And, and I stood here a year ago. Uh, uh, preaching to all of you because I, I get to do the first Sunday every year. I like to think that it's um, because they want to start off the year really, you know, strongly. Um, but I know that uh, it's not because it's confirmation and nobody else wants to do it this week. Um, that's not true. Uh, it's the confirmation piece. So for 10 years, I've gotten uh, to, to, to speak to all of you on the first Sunday of the year. And last year, I stood right here, and I shared with you, I said, look, you know, one of my goals for this year is I want to be more intentional about reading Scripture, which 
I always find some people's reactions to that funny. It's like, a uh, pastor wants to read more scripture. It's like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm not perfect. You know, there, there's still parts of the Bible I haven't read yet. Like, you know, I'll be honest. Okay. And, and so over the course of 2019, I uh, spent time daily reading scripture. And in, I don't know, 25 years uh, that I have made that my goal every year, it was the first year I really stuck to it. And I read through the whole New Testament, and I was like, this is cool. And I was like, you know, you read through things, and you're like, wow, you know, uh, I've read that story before, and I picked up on, you know, and I, uh, you know, I picked up something new this time. And, and sometimes you read stories that you've never read before, and you're like, wow, this is awesome, right? And so that was, that was my experience this past year. And so I finished the New Testament, and I was like, well, uh, what do I do now? I guess I'll start in the Old Testament, right? There's plenty of the Old Testament I haven't read before. So I started in the, in the Old Testament uh, not a, a, a short time ago, and uh, I've been reading through Genesis, and I'm almost done Genesis. But I got to the Joseph story, and uh, the story of Joseph takes up the last dozen or so chapters in, in the book of Genesis. And if you have never read the story of Joseph, I want to encourage you, read it. It's awesome. It's so good. I can't tell you how many times I've read it, and each time I'm like, oh, man, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. And every time I'm like, I, I pull something out new every time. It's amazing how you can read scripture and do that. So anyway, so as I was uh, reading the story of Joseph, uh, the story starts out, Joseph is a teenager. He is rambunctious. Some may say annoying. Maybe a bit impulsive. Definitely annoying. And so... I would love to stand here for a couple hours and walk through his entire biography, but they won't allow me to do that. You're welcome. You can thank uh, the worship team for that. But I want to highlight most of his story very quickly. This is the very abridged version. So if you want to uh, uh, know more details, I would encourage you, you can open up to Genesis, like chapter, I think 37 is where the Joseph story really uh, kicks off. But Joseph is this obnoxious teenager. He is the favorite of all of his brothers, but he is brother number 11. Jealousy ensues, especially when he tells his brothers that one day they're going to bow down to him. So their response is they throw him into the pit and are deciding on whether or not they should kill him. Not a great way to start off your teenage years, right? So Joseph is in this pit. They decide instead of killing him, they're going to sell him off to slavery. So some merchants come along. They sell him to, the, uh, to these traveling merchants. They take him to Egypt. He is sold. Eventually winds up in Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the captain of the guard. I told you we're going through this quickly. Potiphar is the captain of the guard, the palace guard, and, and uh, Joseph begins working for Potiphar, and in his working for Potiphar, begins to work his way up the ladder of uh, Potiphar's household, and eventually becomes Potiphar's right-hand dude. And Potiphar says, you are in control of my whole house. Anything you need, it's all yours. And everything was great until Potiphar's wife Oh, hey, Joseph. But Joseph was a man of great character. And so he chose not to do anything that he shouldn't with his master's wife. But that didn't stop her from making up a story in which Joseph did something inappropriate to her. And so Potiphar, like any husband in that situation of great power, uh, would do as he threw Joseph in jail. And that's where uh, the, it takes us to the passage I want to read with you today, which is, uh, we could spend hours just on this passage, right? So it picks up with Joseph in the prison. This is uh, from Genesis chapter 39. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. In case, uh, you know, there's Bibles over on the side. If you don't have one at home, take one with you. I'd love for you to have one. Uh, and you can read this on your own. Uh, starting at verse 19, it says, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. 
the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with these two officials, and he put them in prison where Joseph was uh, in the palace of the captain of the guard. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. So I want to know, how long was Joseph in prison? For something he didn't do. That's a, that's a rough period of his life, right? But the story doesn't end there. Here's the abridged after story. So he tells the cupbearer and, and the chief baker when they come to him and they say, we, we're having these dreams. And Joseph says, well, uh, God can interpret dreams and, uh, and God can use me to interpret them. So he, he helps interpret their dreams and shares with them their future and says, uh, uh, Baker, I have bad news for you. Um, because of what you did to Pharaoh, you're gonna end up, your life's going to end soon with your head on a pike. Sorry, nothing I can do about that. But cupbearer, good news for you, your position is going to be restored, and you're going to find yourself right uh, back next to Pharaoh shortly. And when you do, don't forget me. Love that part of the story. Because years go by after the cupbearer manages to find himself next to Pharaoh. And years go by, and then Pharaoh eventually has a dream that he needs help interpreting. And so he asks everyone in the nation of Egypt for help. And no one can help him. And then the cupbearer all of a sudden goes, oh, uh, Pharaoh, if I can speak, there's this guy I met in prison. You know, you know when you're mad at me, you sent me to prison. Yeah. So there's this guy. He interpreted my dreams. So Pharaoh summoned Joseph. Joseph interpreted the dreams. They came true. Joseph was brought into the second highest position of power in all of Egypt, Pharaoh's right-hand guy. Talk about your highs and lows, right? And the story continued that one day, Joseph was able to reconcile with his brothers as they found themselves bowing down in front of him like he had predicted in his dreams. A lot going on with that story. Joseph had one crazy journey. But you know what I love about that? Is his story was just that what we read here was decades long. And it was chock full of good stuff. But what I love about that is we can all relate to that because we're all on a journey too. Everyone in this room is on a faith journey. For some of you, your faith journey, where you're at right now is, I don't know if God is real. And that's okay. And I hope and pray that in your journey, that you will discover that God is real. Some of you are on your journey, and you're you're past that point, and you're at the point where you're like, all right, God, I I believe in you. I I trust you. I want to be faithful. Um, what do you want me to do? You know, how can I serve you? How can I, how can I love you with all that I am? And there are some of you that are even further along in your journey, you're like, all right, God, you got to slow down. My knees can't take it. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. Just, you know, ease up on me a bit. And where we are in our journey isn't an age thing. What I mean by that is some of you that are very early in your journey might be very late in your life. And some of you that have grown uh, in in massive leaps and bounds in your journey might be a pretty young person. I was talking with my mom over Christmas break, and we were uh, sitting in my living room, and we were just chatting about random stuff, and, and we 
uh, began to talk about faith journeys. It's not like that's what we do in the pastor's house and we sit and talk about faith journeys all the time. We were in between like talking about movies and TV and books and, you know, uh, Legos because we're in a Lego phase at my house. Um, we were talking about our faith journeys. And my mom was sharing with me that the greatest growth she experienced in her faith journey was when she was my age. So in her late 30s and early 40s, she experienced God in ways that she had never before in her life. In such ways that she, she began to, to take her whole life and find ways to follow God with it. And as we were talking, I was like, like, wow. I'm like, I, it's weird. I, I, I don't know what I would have done if I had to wait this long. I was like, I don't mean that you know, in a bad way, Mom. But you know, I said, for me, my journey, the big leaps in my faith journey were between 17 and 22. So it's not an age thing. Because we can take massive leaps in our faith journey at any age. We have a group of confirmation students sitting in this section, 7th and 8th graders, that are here today to come up and, 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 and kneel down here and be prayed over and to stand uh, where they are right there uh, to publicly confess that, that they believe that Jesus is Lord. Some of them may be doing that for the first time uh, in front of other people. Some of them may have been following Jesus since they were, you know, this big, walking back into Kids Connect, learning what it means to love Jesus, because that's what we talk about in Kids Connect, right? But they're here today to take another step in their journey. So where are you in your journey? Know that your journey's not over. You know how I know that? As long as you have breath, God's not done with you yet. Amen? And so, from the moment we take our first breath to the moment we take our last, we are on that journey with him. And so going back to the story of, uh, of Joseph, uh, there are a few things in Joseph's story that I think are really important for us to understand as, as we walk through our life in this faith journey. And again, I can spend hours talking about each of these things and talk about more, but I, I only wanted to focus on a couple of them. The first one being this. You can't do life alone. And I want to say, oh, you know, we talk about that all the time. Oh, we all agree with that. But I think sometimes that idea pertains to everybody but ourselves. I had a close friend uh, about a month ago share with me that he's been dealing with depression and anxiety for 15 years. close friend. It's like, why? Why'd you wait so long to let me in? But I didn't tell anybody. It's like, for 15 years, I just figured I can manage it on my own. His marriage is on the brink. His life is so broken that he has spent the last month just trying to pick up the pieces. He's worried that all of that has spilled over into the lives of his kids and it's going to affect them when they get older. He has since opened up to all of his close friends and let them in and found a support network that's going to encourage him and challenge him and help him through this time. I've talked to him every day since. Why? Because we're not meant to do life by ourselves. We need other people to be there with us, to care for us, and to walk through things with us. And we need to be that for others. Especially in today's world, 
where there is so much division. There's so many things that our society tells us that we have to keep others at an arm's length. Even in this room, there are many of you that find yourselves on different sides of the political aisle than many others in this room. It can be divisive. You can't have a good conversation about something that, you know, simple as politics. We as a nation are potentially on the brink of war again because of division and disagreements we have with people on the other side of the globe. News broke on Friday of one of the largest denominations of Christianity on the brink of dividing. over something that people can't agree on. It's heartbreaking when there are so many things that divide us when sometimes we need to accept others for their differences and just give them a hug. I don't know if you figure this out yet or not, but you are different from every person in this room. But there's one thing that unites us, and that's Jesus Christ. And so there are people in your life that need you to be there for them in their darkest times. There are people in your life that you need to open up to and share about what's been going on in your life. I could talk for hours on this one, but I want to encourage you and challenge you that you're not meant to do this on your own. And the other thing that I want to mention from the story of Joseph that I found uh, very um, uh, um, critical to our journey is this, that we're going to experience some really low lows and some really high highs in our journey. Joseph found himself in a pit awaiting possible death by his brothers. I don't know how life can get worse than that. He found himself in a jail where all he could see were the walls around him. Where do you find hope when you are sitting in a pit waiting for your brothers to kill you or when you are sitting in a jail with no hope of ever leaving but Joseph found hope because he knew that he couldn't control his circumstances but he could control who he was and what he does So even in those lowest of points, Joseph maintained great integrity and character. And he always remained faithful to God. And when things got to their peak, he maintained great character and integrity and remained faithful to God. You see, there's going to be times in your life And you may be at one of them now where you're at the lowest of lows or the highest of highs. And you can't control the circumstances, but you can control who you are and what you do. How will you remain faithful where you're at right now in your journey? And I want to be clear, this story about Joseph isn't about wealth, it isn't about power, it isn't about prosperity. It isn't about position in life. Because I'm going to venture to say that all of us in this room are never going to get to the point where we are the second most powerful person in the known world. I don't know about you, but I don't want that position. 
I would hate to be the second most powerful person in this room. It's a story about faithfulness. And Joseph remained faithful in and through all things. So how can you be faithful in your journey? And the last thing, and going back to the the passage, I don't know if you picked up on this. Sometimes if you read scripture slower, you'll, you'll catch things. That's what I have to do. Verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. Verse 23, the Lord was with him. That theme continues throughout Joseph's story because in every step of the way, God was with Joseph. In every step of the way, God was with Joseph. So the good news here this morning is that no matter where you are, even if you're struggling to believe in the existence of God, he is standing right next to you, walking this journey with you. He's going to be there every step of the way in the lowest of lows and the highest of highs. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. There's nothing you can do to make him not want to be by your side. But I do want to encourage you. How can you let others in? How can you be there for others? And how can you remain faithful in all situations and circumstances? Let me pray for us. So Jesus, I I lift up this family of people in this room, this community of believers. I pray that as we walk this journey with you, that you would remind us of the things we can control and the things we can't. And may we remember that what we can control is who we are and how we live. May we remain faithful to you this day and always. Amen.